Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Above the heavens. Let, them, let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth. You see monsters in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, fulfilling its command. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. Praise the Lord. Sing, Sing we now a Christmas. Sing.
This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, you are now dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul, too. When the baby Jesus was presented in the temple by his parents, Mary and Joseph, Simeon said, My eyes have seen your salvation. And when I read that and, and heard him in my mind saying that, it reminded me of hearing uh, Martin Luther King Jr. say, I may not get there with you, but I've been to the mountaintop, and my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. And so I chose to um, read for you this sermon that um, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, delivered on Christmas uh, Day. It was a Christmas sermon that he delivered at Ebenezer Baptist Church at Atlanta, Georgia, um, on Christmas Eve, I'm sorry, it was on Christmas Eve, no Christmas Day, Christmas Eve, 1967. And I, I'm also reading it because it's a sermon about peace. And as you know, we are still waiting for peace, hoping for peace, um, looking forward to peace. So we see, um, we see us looking forward to peace and the coming of Jesus, and we see um, also um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King looking for peace to come into our country. And so I will be reading to you this sermon, uh, the complete sermon. This Christmas season finds us ra a rather bewildered human race. We have neither peace within nor peace without. Everywhere, paralyzing fears harrow people day, day by day and haunt them by night. Our world is sick with war. Everywhere we turn, we see its ominous possibilities. And yet, my friends, the Christmas hope for peace and goodwill toward all men can no longer be dismissed as a kind of pious dream of some utopian. If we don't have goodwill toward men in this world, we will destroy ourselves by the misuse of our own instruments and our own power. Wisdom, born of experience, should tell us that war is obsolete. There may have been a time when war served as a negative good by preventing the spread of the growth of an evil force. But the very destructive power of modern weapons of warfare eliminates even the possibility that war may any longer serve as a negative good. And so, if we assume that life is worth living, if we assume that mankind has a right to survive, then we must find an alternative to war. And so let us this morning explore the conditions for peace. 
Let us this morning think anew on the meaning of that Christmas hope. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And as we explore these conditions, I would like to suggest that modern man really go all out to study the meaning of nonviolence, its philosophy and its strategy. We have experimented with the meaning of nonviolence in our struggle for racial justice in the United States. But now the time has come for man to experiment with nonviolence in all areas of human conflict. And that means nonviolence on an international scale. Now let me suggest first that if we are to have peace on earth, our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. Our loyalties must transcend our race, our tribe, our class, and our nation. And this means we must develop a world perspective. No individual can live alone. No nation can live alone. And as long as we try, the more we are going to have war in the world. Now the judgment of God is upon us, and we must either learn to live together as brothers, or we are all going to perish together as fools. Yes, as nations and individuals, we are interdependent. I have spoken to you before of our visit to India some years ago. It was a marvelous experience, but I say to you this morning that there were those depressing moments. How can one avoid being depressed when one sees with one's own eyes evidences of millions of people going to bed hungry at night? How can one avoid being depressed when one sees with one's own eyes thousands of people sleeping on the sidewalks at night? More than a million people sleep on the sidewalks of Bombay every night. More than a million sleep on the sidewalks of Calcutta every night. They have no houses to go into. They have no beds to sleep in. As I beheld these conditions, something within me cried out, Can we in America stand idly by and not be concerned? And an answer came, Oh no. And I started thinking about the fact that right here in our country, we spend millions of dollars every day to store surplus food. And I said to myself, I know where we can store that food free of charge, in the wrinkled stomachs of the millions of God's children in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and even in our own nation who go to bed hungry at night. It really boils down to this that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We are made to live together because of the interrelated structure of reality. Did you ever stop to think that you can't leave for your job in the morning without being dependent on most of the world. You get up in the morning and go to the bathroom and reach over for the sponge, and that's handed to you by a Pacific Islander. You reach for a bar of soap, and that's given to you at the hands of a Frenchman. And then you go into the kitchen to drink your coffee for the morning, and that's poured into your cup by a South American. And maybe you want tea that's poured into your cup by a Chinese. Or maybe you're desirous of having cocoa for breakfast, and that's poured into your cup by a West African. And then you reach over for your toast, and that's given to you at the hands of an English-speaking farmer, not to even mention the baker. And before you finish eating breakfast in the morning, you've depended on more than half of the world. This is the way our universe is structured. This is its interrelated quality. We aren't going to have peace on earth until we recognize this basic fact of the interrelated structure of all reality. Now let me say secondly, that if we are to have peace in the world, men and nations must embrace the nonviolent affirmation that ends and means must cohere. One of the great philosophical debates of history has been over the whole question of means and ends. And there have always been those who argue that the ends justifies the means, that the means really aren't important. 
The important thing is to get to the end, you see. So if you're going to, so if you're seeking to develop a just society, they say, the important thing is to get there. And the means are really unimportant. Any means will do so long as you get there. They may be violent. They may be untruthful means. They may even be unjust means to a just end. There have been those who have argued this throughout history. But we will never have peace in the world until men everywhere recognize that ends are not cut off from means. Because the means represent the ideal in the making and the end in process. And ultimately, you can't reach good ends through evil means. Because the means represent the seed and the end represents the tree. It's one of the strangest things that all the great military geniuses of the world have talked about peace. The conquerors of old who came killing in pursuit of peace, Alexander, Julius Caesar, Charlemagne, and Napoleon, were akin in seeking a peaceful world order. If you will read Mein Kampf closely, you will discover that Hitler contended that everything he did in Germany was for peace. And the leaders of the world today talk eloquently about peace. Every time we drop our bombs in North Vietnam, President Johnson talks eloquently about peace. What is the problem? They are talking about peace as a distant goal, as an end we seek, but one day we must come to see that peace is not merely a distant goal we seek, but that it is a means by which we arrive at that goal. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. All of this is saying that in the final analysis, means and ends must cohere because the end is pre-existent in the means and ultimately, destructive means cannot bring about constructive ends. Now let me say that the next thing we must be concerned about if we are to have peace on earth and goodwill toward men is the non-violent affirmation of the sacredness of all human life. Every man is somebody because he is a child of God. And so when we say, thou shalt not kill, we're really saying that human life is too sacred to be taken on the battlefields of the world. Man is more than a tiny vagary of whirling electrons or a wisp of smoke from a limitless smoldering. Man is a child of God, made in, him, in his image and therefore must be respected as such. Until men see this everywhere, until nations see this everywhere, we will be fighting wars. One day, somebody should remind us that even though there may be political and ideological differences between us, the Vietnamese are our brothers. The Russians are our brothers. The Chinese are our brothers. And one day we've got to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. But in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. In Christ there is neither male nor female. In Christ there is neither communist nor capitalist. In Christ somehow there is neither bound nor free. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And when we truly believe in the sacredness of human personality, we won't exploit people. We won't trample over people with the iron feet of oppression. We won't kill anybody. There are three words for love in the Greek New Testament. One word is eros. Eros is a sort of aesthetic, romantic love. Plato used to talk about it at, great, at a great deal in his dialogues the yearning of the soul for the realm of the divine. And there is and can always be something beautiful about Eros, even in its expressions of romance. Some of the most beautiful love in all of the world has been expressed in this way. 
Then the Greek language talks about phylos, which is another word for love. And phylos is a kind of intimate love between personal friends. This is the kind of love you have for those people that you get along with well. And those whom you like on this level you love because you are loved. Then the Greek language has another word for love, and that is the word agape. Agape is more than romantic love. It is more than friendship. Agape is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill toward all men. Agape is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. Theologians would say that it is the love of God operating in the human heart. When you rise to love on this level, you love all men not because you like them, not because their ways appeal to you, but you love them because God loves them. This is what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies. And I'm happy that he didn't say, like your enemies, because there are some people that I find it pretty difficult to like. Liking is an affectionate emotion, and I can't like anybody who would bomb my home. I can't like anybody who would exploit me. I can't like anybody who would trample over me with injustices. I can't like them. I can't like anybody who threatens to kill me day in and day out. But Jesus reminds us that love is greater than liking. Love is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill toward all men. And I think this is where we are as a people in our struggle for racial justice. We can't ever give up. We must work passionately and unrelentingly for first-class citizenship. We must never let up in our determination to remove every vestige of segregation and discrimination from our nation but we shall not, in the process, relinquish our privilege to love. I've seen too much hate to want to hate myself. And I've seen hate on the faces of too many sheriffs, too many white citizens counselors, and too many Klansmen of the South to want to hate myself. And every time I see it, I say to myself, Hate is too great a burden to bear. Somehow we must be able to stand up before our most bitter opponents and say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. We will meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will, and we will still love you. We cannot, in all good conscience, obey your unjust laws and abide by the unjust system, because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. And so throw us in jail, and we will still love you. Bomb our homes and threaten our children, and as difficult as it is, we will still love you. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our communities at the midnight hour and drag us out on some wayside road and leave us half dead as you beat us. And we will still love you. Send your propaganda agents around the country and make it appear that we are not fit culturally and otherwise for integration. And we will still love you. But be assured that we'll wear you down by our capacity to suffer and one day we will win our freedom. We will not only win freedom for ourselves, we will so appeal to your heart and conscience that we will win you in the process, and our victory will be a double victory. If there is to be peace on earth and goodwill toward men, we must finally believe in the ultimate morality of the universe 
and believe that all reality hinges on moral foundations. Something must remind us of this as we once again stand in the Christmas season and think of the Easter season simultaneously, for the two somehow go together. Christ came to show us the way. Men love darkness rather than light, and they crucified him, and there on Good Friday on the cross, it was still dark. But then Easter came, and Easter is an eternal reminder of the fact that the truth-crushed earth will rise again. Easter justifies Carlyle in saying, no lie can live forever. And so this is our faith as we continue to hope for peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Let us know in the process we have cosmic companionship. In 1963, on a sweltering August afternoon, we stood in Washington, D.C. and talked to the nation about many things. Toward the end of that afternoon, I tried to talk to the nation about a dream I had had. And I must confess to you today that not, not long after talking about that dream, I started seeing it turn into a nightmare. I remember the first time I saw that dream turn into a nightmare, just a few weeks after I had talked about it. It was when four beautiful, unoffending, innocent Negro girls were murdered in a church in Birmingham, Alabama. I watched that dream turn into a nightmare as I moved through the ghettos of the nation and saw my black brothers and sisters perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast, vast ocean of material prosperity and saw the nation doing nothing to grapple with the Negro's problem of poverty. I saw that dream turn into a nightmare as I watched my black brothers and sisters in the midst of anger and understandable outrage, in the midst of their hurt, in the midst of their disappointment, turn to misguided riots to try to solve that problem. I saw that dream turn into a nightmare as I watched the war in Vietnam escalating, and I saw so-called military advisors 16,000 strong turn into fighting soldiers until today over 500,000 American boys are fighting on Asian soil. Yes, I am personally the victim of deferred dreams, of blasted hopes, but in spite of that I close today by saying I still have a dream. Because you know, you can't give up in life. If you lose hope, somehow you lose that vitality that keeps life moving. You lose that courage to be, that quality that helps you to go on in spite of all. And so today I still have a dream. I have a dream that one day men will rise up and come to see that they are made to live together as brothers. I still have a dream this morning that one day every Negro in this country, every colored person in the world will be judged on the basis of the content of his character rather than the color of his skin. And every man will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. I still have a dream today that one day the idle industries of Appalachia will be revitalized and the empty stomachs of Mississippi will be filled, and brotherhood will be more than a few words at the end of a prayer, but rather the first order of business on every legislative agenda. I still have a dream today that one day justice will roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. I still have a dream today that in all of our state houses and city halls, men will be elected to go there who will do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with their God. 
I still have a dream today that one day war will come to an end. That men will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That nation will no longer rise up against nations. Neither will they study war anymore. I still have a dream today that one day the lamb and the lion will lie down together and every man will sit under his own vine and fig tree and none shall be afraid. I still have a dream today that one day every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill will be made low. The rough places will be made smooth and the crooked places straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall, shall see it together. I still have a dream that with this faith we will be able to adjourn the councils of despair and bring new light into the dark chambers of pessimism. With this faith, we will be able to speed up the day when there will be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. It will be a glorious day. The morning stars will sing together and the sons of God will shout for joy. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the love and the knowledge of God. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you in this day and in all the days that are to come. Amen. A chain.